Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Toolbox Tuesday. Today is part one of our two-part housing series that will explore tools and resources for increasing equitable housing access and exploring development trends. Um, my name is David Kiobe. I'm a senior regional planner with SCAG's uh, housing team. So for some housekeeping items, um, today's meeting is approximately an hour and a half long. Um, the meeting is being recorded. All participants will be muted. We'll have a brief Q&A session after each presentation and there'll be a Q&A at the end if time permits. If you have questions during the presentation, please type it into the chat box or press the raise hand function. We'll log all questions and then a voice of selection at the end and voice selection of the questions um, at the end of the presentation if we don't get to them after each presentation. A recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be available on the SCAG website. Um, and I will send a link to everyone registered after the event. So for today's agenda, um, I'll begin by providing an overview of SCAG's housing program. Um, and then we'll have a presentation on ATD's APR dashboard, followed by a presentation on ATD's APFH tool. And finally, we'll have a wrap up. So in terms of SCAG's housing program, it's made up of five main core components. Um, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, RENA, the Regional Early Action Planning Program 1, or REAP 1.0 as we like to call it, the Regional Early Action Planning Program 2, or REAP 2.0, the Housing Working Group, and the RDP, which contains some housing um, related tools um, that can be used. So what is the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, RENA? RENA is a state-mandated process to determine existing and projected housing need in California. The RENA process must be repeated every eight years, and we're currently in the sixth cycle, which runs from 2021 to 2029. The RENA determination for the sixth cycle is approximately 1.3 million housing units for the SCAG region. SCAG develops methodology to assign the 1.3 million units to its jurisdictions in the region, and then jurisdictions must plan to accommodate these units in their housing elements. This means their housing elements must indicate where this future housing could be built and located. Um, so the jurisdictions don't actually have to ensure that the housing is built, just that the zoning is in place to allow for housing production and the city has available sites on which this housing can be potentially built. And this is an overview of the RENA process. So it starts with a determination that's provided by HCD. Um, SCAG then develops a methodology. A draft allocation plan is created. Um, once um, the draft allocation plan is created, jurisdictions can then appeal their uh, draft RENA numbers. And once the appeal process has been completed, the final um, the RENA allocation is finalized. And then the local jurisdictions have to update their housing elements to indicate where um, they could accommodate uh, future housing. In terms of the Regional Early Action Planning Program, SCAG was awarded $47 million by the state in uh, REAP funding, we call it, from Assembly Bill 101 to provide housing planning and process improvements to cities and counties in the SCAG region. The funding was distributed to SCAG members in four large buckets that finance a diverse array of projects from ADU guides, from its streamlining, VNT, to enhance infrastructure financing districts. Um, the four main buckets are partnerships and outreach, which represented $31.3 million, regional housing policy solutions, which represented $2.5 million, sustainable community strategies and integration, which was $9.3 million, and other types of projects, um, which totaled about $44.3 million. Building off the success of the early REAP 1.0 program, um, the state um, advanced $246 million to SCAG to uh, create and fund the Regional Early Action Planning uh, Program 2.0. And 
This expands on the first week program by looking at a broader focus, including integrating housing and climate goals, allowing for broader planning and implementation investments, including infrastructure investments that support infill developments. The broad objectives of the REIT 2.0 program are to accelerate infill development that facilitates housing supply choice and affordability, affirmatively further fair housing, reduce vehicle miles traveled, provide local technical assistance and resources, and strategically complement housing integration. And it is a strategic complement housing and integrating better access to transportation options, including transit and other multimodal services that will be critical in supporting VMT reduction. And here I have an overview of the sort of three main funding streams under um, the week 2.0 program, the early planning initiatives, uh, Connect SoCal implementation strategies that implement a lot of the Connect SoCal recommendations, the transportation partnership programs, the program to accelerate transformative housing, otherwise known as PATH. And um, a lot of these uh, programs have already been opened up and received a great deal of applications from our member jurisdictions. So looking forward to uh, working with them on REIT 2.0. Another part of our housing uh, program here at SCAG is called the Housing Working Group. And it's really a forum for SCAG staff to engage stakeholders in development and implementation of plans, policies that advance the region's mobility, economy, and sustainability. It's not a decision-making body per se, but their input is used to help draft policies and programs. Areas of focus include safe and active streets, equity, natural and farmlands conservation, and sustainable and resilient resilient communities. Um, the meetings are open to the public and may include participation from stakeholders and staff from state, regional, and local agencies. Um, Nonprofit organizations, local universities, and the business community also participate on a regular basis in SCAG's house, housing working group. So I'd now I'd like to hand it over to our presenters, our first being Tom Brinkhouse from HCG, who's going to provide a presentation on the APR dashboard. Tom? Hey, great. Uh, thank you, David. I will begin my screen share. And here we are. Hopefully, you all can see that. <clears throat> Um, like David said, uh, my name is Tom Brinkheis. I am a uh, HCD Specialist 2 within the Data and Innovation Unit um, at the Department of Housing and Community Development. And very pleased to be with you on this Toolbox Tuesday. Let me... Um, okay. So uh, with that, um, so we'll, we'll cover the APR dashboard as well as a couple of other things, but just to give you uh, kind of a, a preamble to that, um, I did want to talk about uh, HCD's data strategy. Um, and so in March of 2022, HCD released a home for every Californian, California's most recent statewide housing plan. As part of this plan, HCD was required for the first time to develop a 10-year data strategy, which evaluates data priorities, identifies data useful to enforce housing laws and inform housing policy. It supports efforts to preserve affordable housing, protect residents, and understand the process and barriers to housing production. It also considers tools and resources needed by state and local government. So under this data strategy, HCD has been developing a variety of housing um, tools, uh, data tools. Uh, some of those include um, to analyze housing production trends and effectiveness of housing element implementation. Um, those kind of fall under uh, data that we collect through the APR, the annual progress report process. 
uh, we've developed tools that um, provide information on sites suitable for housing development that uh, is also collected through progress report um, as well as housing element sites inventories that HCD collects and analyzes. And then finally, um, in terms of uh, align, uh, you know, uh, making data more available um, and accessible, we have uh, posted a lot of our data sets on the California, California Open Data Portal, uh, which aligns with our goals of making data more available and accessible. So to give an overview of the annual progress reports, uh, the annual progress report contains a variety of data related to housing policies and production. This includes information on implementation of housing element programs, and certain implementation uh, and impl implementation of certain housing streamlining provisions enacted by state law. Uh, those include SB 35, uh, which was passed in 2017. And with the uh, 2023 APR, which will, we will be collecting early 2024, we will be getting data on uh, AB 2011, SB 6 provisions. Uh, the APR also contains uh, information on a, uh, housing units in various stages of production. So uh, housing element, uh, housing development applications submitted, uh, projects entitled, uh, units permitted as well as completed. And we have uh, and within that data is also units by structure type, units by affordability, um, uh, identifying information such as parcel numbers, street addresses, and so forth. So there's a lot of data that is collected uh, in this annual progress report. And so just to highlight some of the uh, housing production trends that we are able to identify with the annual progress report data, I want to give a quick spotlight to um, the ADUs. Uh, so ADU streamlining provisions have encouraged ADU production statewide. It had been a bright spot for overall housing production uh, statewide and in the SCAG region. Uh, this slide shows overall permits for ADUs increasing. Uh, this is in the SCAG region. Along with the share of permits reported as ADUs, it has been uh, steadily increasing since uh, 2018, as we can see on this uh, chart. Uh, certain demographic factors play a part in the market, market conditions that make ADUs an attractive option. Um, shrinking household sizes present a natural reason to adapt single family homes to accommodate more than one household. Uh, some research indicates that senior citizens are also likely to build ADUs. Uh, the increase in intergenerational households can also encourage ADU production. And so we see this steady increase all through 2022. And where are these ADUs located? Well, in the Skag region, they're really located um, throughout the region, particularly on the uh, the west side of the region. And according to the data, there have been close to 30,000 ADUs permitted since 2018 that are within areas identified by Skag as high quality transit areas in 2045. Uh, ADUs help increase density in areas with existing residential uses and infrastructure. And so the, the address data that we collect on the APR helps us to geolocate the data and do deeper analysis of the uh, spatial distribution of housing developments. And so with uh, that um, and all of the ADU, or not just ADU, but APR data that we are collecting, we have built a 
APR dashboard. Um, I'll give a quick demo of the dashboard for you all. Uh, the dashboard is available on uh, on HCD's website. Um, so the dashboard starts out with uh, key figures, um, sort of highlights housing units in various stages of development. And just want to point out that if you click on the slicers up top, you can filter the data by a variety of different um, characteristics. So if you're interested in just the SCAG region, uh, you can filter by that. If you're interested only in, you know, uh, uh, structures that have five or more units within them, you can collect on that and you can see uh, everything will uh, update. Um, so this particular page is showing total, uni total units uh, as well as the units broken down by four different income categories. Another page of our dashboard highlights uh, the time it takes for housing projects to go from one development stage to the next. Um, and uh, so this is uh, re really we're trying to build out uh, our capability to analyze, you know, where housing production may be taking longer, uh, what are the factors contribute to that. Um, and so this data is helping us to uh, be able to make those connections. And so you can see here, um, this is how long it takes for, for a housing development application to, to be submitted uh, up until uh, to the time it takes for it to become approved or entitled. Um, and we can see sort of where it may be taking longer. Um, Average averages over the past 18 months, seems like it's kind of going up, but, um, you know, and one nice thing about this dashboard too, is you're able to actually view the data. So if you're click on San Francisco, they're at the top of the list and you're interested in seeing, you know, what projects these are, you can view the data here and it will take you to kind of the, you know, the raw data and you can, you can view the projects where we have, where, where we're able to build out the submitted to entitled timeframe. And we can see that uh, there's a variety of different projects here, including even an ADU at the top. But um, so you really have access to the entire data set through this APR dashboard. Um, we have housing construction by income category. So just a variety of different charts here that uh, break down the units by tenure, units by structure type, and then um, within that, the units by affordability. Um, and then again, you can view the data. So if you're interested in units permitted in Los Angeles, I've clicked on Los Angeles here, I can view the data and we can see all of the projects. Um, the dashboard contains a variety of maps uh, related to uh, lower uh, lower income housing unit production relative to total units, as well as the entire geolocated uh, APR data set. Um, for the map on the right, it uh, just give it a second; it'll load. It really. Um, helps to actually kind of filter uh, filter down this map by like county or something smaller so that um, you're able to see is uh, it, it can't display all the all the dots at once so if you if you filter down you can you can see and you can start to see you know if you zoom in you can start to see you know permit activity and sort of uh, how housing development is occurring through you know, subdivisions being built out or, uh, you know, perhaps permits uh, issued in the central city. Um, so, uh, you know, where newer develop developments may be occurring. This is uh, what they call Crocker Village in uh, Sacramento. 
kind of uh, infill development, but it's it's got a several hundred units, so we can see the build building permits issued for that. And then um, another page highlights the uh, construction by structure type. Uh, going this one actually goes back to 2013, but we can see and this is where that ADU data came from previously. Uh, increase in ADUs statewide. Um, it's really been going up with the city of Los Angeles uh, really at the forefront of that. <laughs> Dashboard contains information on the regional housing needs allocation. So like David mentioned, uh, the RENA process, we can uh, look up those numbers on the dashboard um, by region, uh, by, you know, county, which would be the sum of all of the uh, jurisdictions within that county. And so we can look up those numbers here. Um, and perhaps more importantly, we can evaluate the progress in meeting those numbers uh, with the building permit data that is reported on the APR. We compare it to what the is and are able to kind of um, determine, you know, the, the percentage in, in, in meeting the arena, both total permits as well as by uh, the four different income categories. Um, so if we click on, for example, the city of Los Angeles, we can see that, um, you know, they're, by this, they're 25% through the cycle. And this this is, uh, there's a bit of a lag here because we will be getting their 2023 APR in 2024. And then those uh, these numbers will uh, update to include the 2023 year. Um, which hasn't been counted yet. And so uh, hopefully they, once they do submit that APR, these uh, percentages attained will um, start to start to rise even higher. Um, finally, the dashboard contains some other data on just implementation more broadly, uh, housing element compliance. Uh, if they've submitted their APR, um, that is, noted here on this page. Um, and then finally, housing element programs. So what jurisdictions uh, have uh, committed to in their housing element, um, and then the status in implementing that. So we can just click on LA here, just as an example. Uh, we can see all of the programs that the city of Los Angeles has included in their housing element, um, as well as the status in implementing it. So, um, you know, useful for HCD to sort of refer to this and evaluate how programs are throughout uh, throughout the plan. Uh, so that's the APR dashboard. It's a lot of data. Um, and uh, yeah, we encourage you to uh, to check it out. And with that, I will uh, kind of go over a couple of other data tools. To advance here, here we go. Um, so we've also partnered with the uh, Department of General Services to create a housing and local land development opportunity map. Uh, this is a map that contains uh, lands that have, have been identified as surplus um, by the local uh, local agency, as well as lands that have been identified uh, in the housing element as being suitable to accommodate the regional housing need. Um, so those sites are mapped. Um, and uh, the information uh, information about those sites can be queried. So if you're interested in, you know, a, a excess site that's uh, just in, as in this example that's in Riverside County, 
that um, is between 35 and 45 acres. Um, you're able to query the data set and then achieve, you know, obtain the results. And then you can uh, kind of view them on the map. You can view the parcel uh, dimensions, um, other parcel uh, attributes, um, and, um, you know, uh, you know, and then potentially, you know, pursue that site for uh, housing development. <clears throat> I mentioned the California Open Data Portal. Um, so if you would like to obtain any of uh, this data, um, the, the raw data, um, it's available on the California Open Data Portal. You can see here, this is just a screenshot of like the APR tables. Um, and uh, there are data dictionaries in there to kind of help you to, um, you know, figure out what the columns are and so forth. Um, the, uh, and through the open data portal, you can view the data um, as you, as you can see here, uh, the bottom half of, half of the screen, you can download the data in CSV format. Um, the open data portal also provides an API um, uh, through which you can uh, directly connect to uh, to these data sets. Um, and these are updated weekly. So we export the data out of our database once a week, and then we uh, upload upload it to the open data portal. So it's pretty much up to, up to date. Um, and then finally, I'll just give you a quick preview of something we're, we're building um, and hopefully we'll be on our website soon, but it's a housing element sites inventory data viewer. Um, so all of the sites inventories through uh, that are submitted as part of the housing element review, uh, we are compiling uh, data um, about them, including some summary statistics that show you know, capacity by general plan designation, zoning, um, how many units the uh, inventory can accommodate, um, and so forth, and some kind of interesting statistics. Um, but that's not quite on our website yet, but hopefully will be within the next uh, several weeks. And if you're interested on um, HCD, uh, all things HCD, you can sign up for our email, the listserv, as well as follow us on social media. Perfect. Thank you for that great presentation, Tom. Um, we have one question in the chat from Jennifer. Can we search by coastal or non-coastal surface sites? Um, good question. Um, if uh, by coastal, do you mean in the coastal zone? Um, I guess, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't believe you can search by coastal zone. Um, but with uh, probably a little bit of GIS finagling, you could add a coastal zone layer, um, and then, uh, maybe do that analysis on your own, but I don't believe the map allows you to, uh, do that search directly. Thank you for that response and thank you, Jennifer, for your question. Any other questions at this time? Okay, if not, we'll be moving on to our next pre presenter. If something does come up, uh, please pop it in the chat and we'll uh, make sure to try to address it at the end of the uh, Toolbox Tuesday session. Thank you. And uh, now over to you, Marissa. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Marissa Prossi. I'm a senior housing policy specialist in the housing policy division um, with Tom for uh, at HCD. Um, so my work sets that uh, the inter intersection of land use and fair housing. 
Uh, and today I'll be giving an overview of our AFFH data viewer mapping tool. Um, this is a tool intended to help local governments and other stakeholders better understand and analyze for housing issues and is available um, on that HED's, you know, Housing Open Data Tools webpage that Tom mentioned in his presentation. Uh, before giving a demo of the tool, I'll briefly give a high level overview of the requirements of AFH in California state law. So I always think it's helpful to start off with a definition of affirmatively furthering fair housing or AFFH. So California Assembly Bill 686 in 2018 defines affirmatively furthering fair housing as taking meaningful actions in addition to combating discrimination that overcome patterns of segregation and foster inclusive communities free from barriers that restrict access opportunity based on protected characteristics. The duty to affirmatively further fair housing extends to all of a public agency's activities and programs relating to housing and community development. Uh, specifically, these meaningful actions must aim to accomplish the following. So address significant disparities in housing needs and an access opportunity, replace segregated living patterns with truly integrated and balanced living patterns, um, transform racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty into areas of opportunity, and foster and maintain compliance with civil rights and fair housing laws. So some may ask, you know, what is the need for newer California's AFFH efforts given that the Fair Housing Act has existed since 1968? Well, despite the half century mandate and obligation to prohibit discrimination in housing, forces driving residential segregation still persist in the present day. Racially explicit practices were eventually replaced by more subtle methods to exclude people of color from predominantly white high resource neighborhoods. Over time, single family zoning emerged to replace race-based zoning as a tool for segregating communities and exclusionary zoning policies combined with the practice of placing affordable housing in low resource neighborhoods instead of high, res high resource communities continue to reinforce the spatial segregation of low income communities and communities of color here in California and across the nation. Housing policy program guidelines and regulations were essential in creating current inequities and they are also equally important in both preventing further segregation and concentration of poverty, as well as increasing widespread access to opportunity for all. Uh, and importantly for today's presentation, you usually can't address the issues you have without first being able to measure them. So to ameliorate these persistent patterns, the California legislature passed AB 686 in 2018. This law establishes an independent state mandate to expand the duty of all California's public agencies to affirmatively further fair housing. Uh, the bill poses two major requirements. First, it mandates that all state and local public agencies to facilitate deliberate action to explicitly address, combat, and relieve disparities resulting from past patterns of segregation to foster more inclusive communities. Uh, and importantly to note, this is a requirement separate of the housing element. And then second, starting in January 1st, 2021, the bill established requirements that apply to all housing elements of the general plan. This means that in order for housing elements to be found in compliance, they need to meet these AFH requirements. Uh, ACD released an initial memo after AB 686 was signed and then followed that up in 2021 with an AFFH guidance memo and the release of the AFFH data viewer, which I will highlight today. Um, these were created to assist local governments with these AFFH requirements. Um, and since we initially launched the AFFH data viewer in 2021, we have continued to add to and refine the tool. So, you know, while we don't have time today to get into all of the housing element AFH requirements, I do want to briefly highlight the ones that influence the content and design of the AFH data viewer tool and where the tool may be helpful um, in any ongoing work on housing elements. So generally, the housing element requirements include five AFH related components, outreach, 
the assessment of fair housing, uh, the data heavy one that we'll focus on today, which is composed of a number of different analyses to understand fair housing issues, uh, the site inventory uh, to ensure that sites identified to accommodate future housing growth needs affirmatively further fair housing. Um, the AFH data viewer tool can also be helpful with this analysis. Um, an identification and prioritization of the most salient contributing factors to the fair housing issues. And lastly, commitments to a number of actions and programs to address fair housing issues. Um, and so the chart on the right kind of shows some of this relationship of those two requirements and the embedded requirements under the housing element requirements. Um, if you are interested in better understanding these AFH uh, requirements, um, additional materials are available on our AFH and housing element web pages on HCD's website. So, um, you know, as you'll see in our the, the live demo I'll do of the tool, the AFH data viewer is organized by the five assessment of fair housing areas of analysis. Um, these are fair housing enforcement and outreach capacity, segregation and integration of protected classes and by income, disparities in access to opportunity, particularly for education, transportation, economic, and environmental, disproportionate housing needs, including displacement, and racially ethnically concentrated areas of poverty and racially concentrated areas of affluence. Um, in addition, as you'll see, the AFH data viewer tool has two other data sections. One is, you know, existing affordable housing assets, things like um, subsidized affordable housing uh, developments, public housing, housing choice voucher usage, et cetera. Uh, and then lastly, some supplemental data. Uh, in the housing element, there must be an assessment for each of these five areas of analysis, locally and regionally. You should include an analysis of patterns and trends and should utilize both local data and knowledge as well as other relevant factors like the history of land use practices in the jurisdiction. Lastly, there must be a summary of fair housing issues that stem from the findings of the assessment of fair housing. Uh, and this summary of fair housing issues should inform the housing element programs. Uh, because the assessment of fair housing is by nature a data rich exercise, HCD created the AFH data viewer to assist jurisdictions who may have less capacity for data work, you know, spend less um, time or money, consultant money on data analysis, and to democratize this data for the public and advocates who are participants and commenters on housing elements. You know, so by having data available on these five fair housing issue areas in one place. We hope that jurisdictions will more clearly identify patterns and trends in their communities and create better targeted uh, and more equitable fair housing programs. You know, as a note, while the AFFH related housing element requirements directly informed the design of the AFFH data viewer tool, HCD hopes that the tool uh, has and will be utilized by local and regional jurisdictions uh, you know, governments, advocates, and other stakeholders for a wide range of efforts to better understand fair housing patterns and trends. So the AFH data viewer tool, uh, you know, is intended to assist in analyzing patterns and trends, both locally and regionally in housing elements to better tailor housing element programs to address, you know, the most salient fair housing issues. Uh, this should include things like data tables, maps, um, and a narration of those trends. Uh, one thing to note, um, you know, you may have seen this pop up in some housing element review letters. You know, it's important not to just present data, but to assess the patterns and trends to guide site selection and to identify solutions for housing element programs. Um, it's also important to remember that this data should be paired with other qualitative data sources, such as local data and knowledge, um, you know, gathered through public input and stakeholder feedback processes, you know, the history of governmental barriers or lack of action, and other relevant factors. Uh, so this data is not intended to stand um, alone in any analyses in the housing element. 
And then lastly, it's important for jurisdictions to connect the dots uh, when using this data or in their analyses. So, you know, you shouldn't just insert data tables or maps or statistics without explaining the significance of those data points to the larger trends. Okay, so now with that overview in mind, on to the main event, the AFH data viewer tool. Um, so as you can see, parts of the AFH requirements in a housing element are somewhat data intensive. And so as a result, HCD has created this interactive tool to assist jurisdictions and advocates in analyzing fair housing trends. Um, the tool can be accessed from the AFH webpage on HCD's website and includes a number of downloadable data layers. Um, so I will now switch to a live demo of the tool and walk through a few of the features. Great. Um, so, you know, we're gonna start with our, uh, from our HCD AFFH webpage. Uh, if you haven't been here before, this is a great tool for a better understanding um, the obligation and duty to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, so on this page, there's a bit of background on AB 686, um, links to the AFH guidance memo um, and some additional resources, as well as the link to the AFH data viewer tool. Um, I have some tabs already clued up, queued up, but uh, if you were to click on this, it would take you to the AFH data viewer landing page. Um, and so, like I mentioned, HED created this data tool with a few audiences in mind. You know, first, it's meant to help jurisdictions in preparing, you know, the FH related sections of their housing element, in particular, the assessment of fair housing. Um, but, you know, we're, we're excited to see folks have used it in other ways, and we're, we hope that trend continues, you know, for advocates or, uh, you know, elect officials or, you know, your non-housing element related work. Um, you know, this tool can be used um, in a number of different ways. A lot of the data on the tool is publicly available from other sources, but here, you know, it's all in one location. Um, and second, it's processed and on a platform that is easy to access and doesn't require any data processing or mapping by the user itself. Um, I'll also note that this is a, a living tool. And so we uh, regularly update the underlying data, um, as well as our adding new data sources periodically. Um, one feature that I will highlight, so if you scroll down here, there is a how-to guide, which you can access, you know, right here where my cursor is. This will take you to our how-to user guide. Um, and, you know, this, uh, you know, might be helpful as you acquaint yourself with the tool, you know, it goes through how to view and download data layers, you know, viewing original data sources, print functionality, um, you know, exporting to PDF or, or whatnot, and then adding your own data viewer, um, you know, search bar and more here. So that's the how to guide. Uh, so back on the landing page here, um, I'll also highlight, you know, the map view is kind of the main you know, the heart of the tool, but there are also places to um, explore the data by topic. You can also access that up here in the top left. You know, you click this here, it'll take you to data, which would show you um, this screen. And so you can see all of the individual data layers and download them from here. So back on uh, this landing page here. Um, so lastly, Clicking here, click here to access the map. Um, this will take you to um, the uh, AFH data viewer view. Um, and so, you know, when you first open this up, um, this will has a pop up as an intro to the tool. It goes through how to kind of use the tool. Um, with the clicking on the arrows to expand the categories to see the different data layers, clicking on the little eyeball to view layers or turn it off, um, as well as you know how to access um, additional information about the underlying data um, and metadata and whatnot, as well as a link to that how-to guide. So you click out of that and then you're into the main uh, view of the tool. Um, so, you know, first off, well, usually when I'm entering the data viewer tool, it can 
So oftentimes you're not looking at the entire, you know, you're not entering this tool or using this tool to view the entire state. Um, it's a little bit hard to view the entire state. So I'll oftentimes go to the search bar right here, the little magnifying glass. Um, and I will type in, it's getting a little slow right now. Um, but uh, let's say I'll go to a specific jurisdiction. So for today, let's go to Long Beach. Again, it's being a little slow, but that'll zoom you in directly to the, the place you want to be. So today we're going to look at Long Beach. Um, and so you see on the bottom right hand corner here where my uh, cursor is circling, um, this is where, you know, the main data layers live on the tool. So if we click on uh, each one, we'll bring up a different set of data layers. So I'll start with this first one. Um, so you see here the the second through six are those five areas of analysis. Um, and the first one here is existing affordable housing assets. And the last one is supplemental data. So um, as you'll see here, the tool is organized by those layers that are recommended as well as those that are additional. Um, you know. For jurisdictions using the data viewer to prepare housing elements, we wanted to denote which layers are recommended by HCD for use and then which data layers are provided as additional. These additional layers could be things that help to show trends over time. So, you know, the same data version, but an older version of the ACS data, um, or maybe needed only needed for a subset of jurisdictions based on local conditions. So here on the first data category, existing affordable housing assets, we see under recommended that we have, you know, subsidized housing, public housing buildings, emergency shelter housing, as an inventory count, and then housing choice vouchers. Um, if I click uh, the eyeball off, you will see it populate. So here we've got, you know, um, these in blue. And as I click on data layers, they will auto populate the legend up above here on the top right. Um, and then, you know, we can start to see, you know, you can look at multiple layers at once. And so, you know, let's say I turn on those first two and housing choice vouchers, you can start to analyze maybe some patterns or trends of where um, things are clustered. Um, and then we see also in the additional layers, we have mobile home parks here uh, listed under additional. Um, so let's see, to show another feature, we have this info um, little icon to the right of every data layer. So if I click on that info um, icon, it'll pull up um, the individual metadata or uh, info page and uh, my it's being a little slow today, but you'll see up here, it'll pull up the description of that individual data layer um, and, you know, links to uh, the source data and whatnot. Let's see. Um, one other thing. So if I want to, you know, for all of the individual data layers, you can click on um, the individual points data um, to pull up additional, you know, and then there will be a pop up with additional information. So, you know, I can see that this dot here, um, you know, the street address, as well as how many units are there and how many of those are affordable, you know, estimated affordability end year date, um, and some other notes and whatnot. Um, for some of these data layers, so let's see, that's a good example. Um, Oh, yeah. And if I click off the eyeball, then all of the data layers that I have turned on here will also turn off. Um, one cool example of that is um, for predominant population by race ethnicity. Um, if I click on a specific census tract or pop up, it'll also pull up, you know, it's displayed on the map as, you know, the predominant uh, population, but also in the pop up will give you more underlying information, um, stylized and, you know, pie chart and whatnot. Let's see. So 
those are the pop-ups. And then, you know, just to kind of give you a sense of what's under each of these categories here, for racially or ethnically concentrated areas, we have both, um, uh, you know, the high segregation and poverty areas, as well as the racially concentrated areas of affluence, uh, in disparities in access to opportunity. Here we have, um, you know, high quality transit stops and half mile buffers around those. We have, you know, the opportunity maps, uh, as well as Cal and Viro screen, um, you know, and some other access to, to jobs data. For uh, fair housing enforcement and outreach capacity, these are things that we have the fair housing uh, enforcement and outreach inquiries by city and cases by city provided from HUD. Under segregation and integration, there are a number of data sources available here. There's that predominant populations one I highlighted, you know, populations with disabilities, poverty status, uh, median income, um, and some other familiar uh, characteristics, uh, as well as under additional, you have things uh, like the HOLC redlining maps um, and some other uh, older versions of similar data sources as well to do some trends over time analysis. Uh, under disproportionate housing needs and displacement risks, here, you know, you've got, uh, you know, age of structures, uh, percent of units lacking uh, complete plumbing or kitchen, you know, your point in time counts, um, overpayment, cost burden data, as well as uh, displacement, estimated displacement risk um, data sources as well. And then lastly, under supplemental data, um, again, all of these would be additional, uh, not necessarily recommended, but here you have things such as environmental hazard layers like flooding and fire risk, uh, as well as the SB 535 disadvantaged communities. All right, and then a couple, uh, I'll leave that one on for now. So then a couple functionality things I want to highlight. So in the bottom left here, you see this printer icon. Uh, let's say that we want to include, you know, this flooding, flood hazard areas map. Um, you would go here and the little printer icon, you know, pick which uh, format you want it in uh, and then press print. And that would, you know, have a little download thing and have it already pre-formatted for you. Um, in addition here, you can upload your own data to include in, you know, overlaying with these data layers. Um, this information little thing, if you click here, that'll pull up that initial splash screen information. You know, here you can change the underlying base map uh, imagery or, you know, measure tool uh, if you want to measure distances between something. Um, and then lastly, here on the submit feedback, um, this will take you, uh, you know, to set basically submit an email uh, to uh, our AFFH guidance at hcd.ca.gov inbox. Um, so if there's, you know, uh, an error in the tool you're encountering, or if you have a question on how to use a certain function of the tool, um, our staff monitors an inbox and is happy to um, our sister where we can. Um, it's also the same email uh, address for each if you have any uh, questions generally, generally about uh, the AFH guidance. And so I think with that, uh, that completes the data demo part of the presentation. Um, and I want to thank you for your time having us um, and we'll open it up for any questions. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, so we have two questions in the chat box. The first being is, can you describe how the housing element requirements relate to the federal AFFH requirements to federal HUD block grants eligible communities, including the new pending regulations? Yeah, so um, a few things to note there. So AB 686 essentially enshrined the 2015 the federal 2015 AFH rule with some minor modifications in California state law. So regardless of what happens at the federal level, 
um, you know, California state AFH requirements are entrenched in law and that is the law of California. Um, you know, as you kind of um, insinuate in your question, you know, as many of you probably know, the Biden administration's uh, HUD under the Biden administration is currently has a, a draft a proposed rule that was um, out for public comment earlier this year. And we intend for, you know, some version of a final rule uh, to come out uh, in the coming months or next year sometime. And so um, when that happens, uh, you know, California state law will, uh, you know, without further action by the legislature, um, you know, California law will remain as is, you know. Uh, so I think the idea is, you know, the, a lot of the work done in housing elements over the last few years on AFH should make, uh, you know, responding to the requirements under HUD easier. Um, they might not be perfectly aligned and there may be, you know, efforts by the state once that final rule comes out to better understand how to provide TA for, uh, you know, recipients of, you know, federal funding, you know, how to navigate these two things together, um, or if there are further changes then. But, you know, regardless of basically the, the, the high level takeaway is regardless of uh, federal action on this California state law uh, remains as is, unless there is further action taken by the legislature. Okay, thank you. Um, a second question, can jurisdiction use mapping tools other than HCD's AFFH Data Viewer or HUD's mapping tools for their housing elements? Yeah, absolutely. This tool is, um, you know, it's not a requirement to use it. Um, it's really meant as a um, tool, you know, and capacity saver for jurisdictions across California in that regard. Um, so it should be, you know, it is a tool also available to HCD housing alert reviewers and advocates. And so the idea is that all this information is available in one place. Um, so, you know, reviewers oftentimes reference it as they're doing their reviews as well. And so they might have questions based on things they're seeing and, you know, if there's discrepancy in the different data sources, but it's not a requirement to use the tool. Great, thank you. Um, we have a demonstration request. Um, can you demonstrate an example of finding a housing site using the AFFH tool? So I wouldn't say, um, maybe like I'll clarify that a bit. So I think mm -hmm. the idea is that each of the, you know, I listed those like five components of um, the AFFH requirements and housing. So the first one's outreach, then there's this assessment of fair housing, then there's the identification of sites, and then there's the um, identification prioritization of, of the most salient contributors to fair housing issues, and then lastly, programs. The idea is that those five things happen in that order, roughly, right? That each of the next ones should, in, you know, each one should inform the next. Um, you know, the first three, you know, couple can happen simultaneously and should inform each other. But essentially that, um, you know, through that local knowledge and, you know, information, as well as the data available in these data sources, a jurisdiction should identify their most salient fair housing issues and trends. Um, you know, then there's, you know, in the programs, uh, you know, there, are, as well as the sites to ameliorate those salient fair housing issues. Um, so the idea is that um, in your identification and selection of sites, um, this may, and you know, it should bring to light what those salient fair housing issues are, um, and then guide you as you're selecting sites in order to combat some of those fair housing issues that may be prevalent. Um, you know, we, uh, I am not a housing element reviewer, but um, a lot of times in housing elements, there will be, uh, the reviewers may look at, you know, the overlaying your sites with some of these data layers um, and how those patterns uh, compare uh, based on the income levels of the sites identified as well. Hope that helps. Um, do we have any other questions? I 
If not, uh, Jennifer, could you please, um, Jennifer A.V., could you please pull up uh, my slides one more time? So in terms of our next Toolbox Tuesday session, it's currently scheduled for November 14th from 12.30 to 2 p.m. This is part of the housing series part two. Um, so it'd be great if you guys can register and attend. Um, we'll be focusing on uh, tools that are very useful in terms of site identification. Um, so that's a set you don't want to miss. Um, if you have any questions, um, please contact the local information services team. Um, the email address is list at scag.ca.gov so if you have any questions. And finally, we have a link to a survey so we can get some quick uh, feedback on Toolbox Tuesday, which helps us kind of cater our content and uh, make us a very useful uh, resource for all of you. So we really do appreciate your feedback. So if you do have time, please fill out the quick two-minute survey for us. Appreciate it. And yes, yeah, session two starts at 1 p.m. It's a typo. Apologize. So if there's nothing else. Uh, thank you again so much. Again, if you do have follow-up questions, uh, please uh, shoot us an email and we'll make sure to get your response. Thank you everyone for joining us today.